I'm here in the capacity of the president of the News Women's Club of New York because what you have accomplished here today is what we did, the News Women's Club did, 92 years ago. We went and did it. There was a need, there was a vacuum, and as we were saying earlier today, the damn fools didn't know it couldn't be done, so they went ahead and did it anyway. And so in 1922, some of the most famous newswomen of the day, who were covering some of the largest news stories in the world, the most important news stories in the world, started their own press club. And the reason they did that was because they really weren't generally welcome in the sort of loosely knitted press, press organizations, professional press organizations of the day because of gender. They, a lot of them had gone on for years without bylines. Nellie Bly was an exception. Her byline was known all over the world. But a lot of very famous newswomen didn't have bylines. They weren't allowed to sit in the newsroom. It was very rare in the early part of the last century for newswomen to actually have a desk inside the newsroom. Some of them were on other floors. Some of them were in the hallways. And it took years to literally get the gates down so they could get into the newsroom. What you do here today is very important in terms of learning, meeting each other, understanding topics and issues that are still important 92 years later, like equal pay for equal work, meritocracy, um, equal, equal pairing with assignments, and jobs and promotions. All these issues have come up and there will, more will come up this afternoon. They were issues 92 years ago. And we've made a lot of progress, but as journalists, we need to be aware that there are still lots of situations in the work environment that require us to be part of a strong network. If you leave here today without a stack of business cards. If you leave here today without email addresses and phone numbers, yes, phone numbers, you will have failed. Because what the most you should get out of this day is the foundation for a very strong network. And then you should operate within that network once you leave here. It takes time to build it. It doesn't happen overnight. You have to nurture it. You really have to make an investment in building a personal network. But it's vital. If you're going to succeed in a very, very competitive industry, it is absolutely imperative to have a professional network. That's one of the things the News Women's Club provides. Why is a network important? Anybody? Why is a network important to advance in your career today? Jan. Jan says you need this network to get, to get sources. You need a network to call about getting a job. Two different networks. You're absolutely right, but they're two different networks. I want to never have to turn to my sources for help with a career. I don't want them to get involved in that way. I want to keep them separate and independent and autonomous of what I do in my personal and professional life, apart from my writing news stories. However, the other network Jan mentioned, which is if you need a job, that's where this personal, professional network comes in. It's so very important. Where are the men in this audience? We have one. OK, we have a few gentlemen in this audience. Men have known all along what women think we're first discovering, which is that it's really important to help each other. They tap each other on the shoulder. Hey, Joe, you're new in town. You just got this job, right? Come on for a beer tonight. We'll tell you how it works. Women tend not to do that. 
Joe, didn't you work overseas a few years ago? We've got this amazing posting coming up. You'd be perfect for it. I'm going to give you the inside track on it. Come on, I'll tell you about it. Women tend not to do that. You hear about that at places like the News Women's Club because it's a network outside of the fiercely competitive newsroom. And it becomes more collegial and more helpful when it occurs outside the workplace. And that's where you have to build this professional network. Women need to be able to call upon each other to help each other to swap information about jobs, about training, about new skills, about trends coming up in the industry. You might leave here today with really important information about something new that's starting to evolve in our business. You would want to pass that information along, hopefully. That's very important. The other reason this network is so important is because Traditionally, women in very high positions, classically, sort of traditionally, historically, tend not to help other women. Somebody was saying they heard that this morning at a panel. When Christiane Amanpour accepted the News Women's Club Reporter of the Year Award a couple of years, um, the Front Page Award for Reporter of the Year, one of the things she said was that the people who helped her come along largely mostly were not women. And in my experience, the worst managers and editors I ever worked for were women. They don't, they tend not to help each other. Now, there are always exceptions to the rule. We have we're here today, Rita Henley Jensen, who's the editor-in-chief of Women's E! News, can't do enough to help women come along professionally. But by and large, women who have made it into that rarefied space in the news industry, who are senior managers, tend not to help other women up the ladder. The attitude tends to be, I got here, you can do it too. Go do it. But you do need a network. You do need help to accomplish that. And that's where the cards and the phone numbers and the email addresses you take away with you today will come in handy. You must start to build a network that is viable, that is contactable, people you can reach in an emergency. I have a job interview coming up. I need to do a practice interview. Will you meet me tonight? Can we do this? Has anybody here ever done anything like that? Raise your hand. Has anybody ever done, how many? Oh, come on. Okay, so about a third of you, not even, about a fourth of you have reached out to someone somewhere along the line and said, I need help with something. Every hand should have gone up in this room. Hopefully when we get back here next year, every hand will go up. So you must, you must, you must, Find these professional outlets outside of work. I mean, you know, the women who started the News Women's Club in 1922 worked for some of the biggest newspapers in the world. The Times, The World, The Sun, The News, The Herald, The Tribune, The Telegram, The Journal, The Brooklyn Eagle. They were, there were more than a dozen big papers in this town. They were as competitive as you possibly can get in terms of their assignments and their work. But when it came to the News Women's Club, they couldn't help each other enough. And that has prevailed all these years. It's one of the most amazing environments for networking and for learning new skills and hearing about jobs and helping each other get jobs and so on. They are few and far between. News Women's Clubs are very few and far between. So basically, the message has to be that you carry away from this session. Build a network outside the office that you can rely on 24-7 when you need it. Keep it active, nurture it, and expand it. Okay? Now, Louise said she'd like this to be interactive, and I agree. So I'd like to open the floor to questions. I think we might have a few. And let's start a discussion. Anyone? Hi. Hi. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Hope. I'm a student here at Columbia Middle School. School. Um, why do you say that women are just discovering this now? And why do you think it's taken us so long to start helping? Oh, it goes back to hunter-gatherer societies. It's a very tribal thing. No, it really is. No, but I wanna, I, yeah, I do. I want to know. It's a very tribal thing. If you think about the classic societies that we still look at as cultural wonders and societies that um, had languages that are almost vanishing from the earth, but we still know them historically. Women had a very specific place in society. They, they got together to grind grains. They made yarn, then they turned the yarn into fabric, then they made garments. They raised the children, they taught the children, they taught the language. While men went out in groups, they went out in hunting parties, war parties, um, they were the governors, the government within the society. So women had their place, men had their place. And it was, it was the way the societies grew and developed and thrived. But as time has changed our world, the differences that emerged were men and women kept separate places. Just historically, we've sort of, sort of stayed away from each other in terms of what we do to function in the society. So where men would say to each other, hey, Joe, come on, we're going out deer hunting this morning, get your bow, whatever, <laughs> let's go out, women would tend to wait for the group to gather. And they understood this. And they talked through life while they made quilts and jam and took the kids back and forth to sport practice. And so they didn't really develop the skills until I would say it started over the last, what, Rita, 50 years? Over the last 50 years, we started developing skills where we understood that it was important to reach out directly. <coughs> one-on-one, -on -one, to small groups, to gather in a professional environment that was designed to do something other than a group project. And there was nothing wrong with those group projects, and there's still nothing wrong with them, so long as we understand that there is a need to, to move outside the group and function individually, function in pairs, tap each other on the shoulder, and help each other along individually, as opposed to bringing the group along. Yes. Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm a freelance radio and TV producer. I just moved here recently from Minneapolis. Um, <laughs> as a freelancer, and I, you probably had lots of things going on as well, it's, you're just really busy all the time. Uh, and I always found that it, the problem wasn't the size of my network, it was the issue of nurturing the network, like you mentioned before. And so I'm just wondering, what is your suggestion for nurturing a network? Because I always found myself feeling kind of guilty, being like, well, I know this person over here and they could really help me out in this situation, but I feel bad that I haven't talked to them in months and now I'm just asking them for something out of the blue. Um, what is your suggestion for that? carve the time out of your day. You find the time. You find the time to eat. You find the time to sleep. You find the time to work. You must find the time to network. It's imperative. We just, our, our April newsletter for the News Women's Club talks about relationships and how important it is to build professional relationships within your work environment, within your beats and your bureaus. But how essential it is to find the time, and look, some of us, who I work 14 to 16 hours a day. News Women's Club is a second full-time job. But we find the time. We have a very active board of women who are mostly full-time news women. They find the time. We run one of the largest journalism competitions in the world every year, the Front Page Awards. Nobody is paid. And you, they come in and they sit down and they start to sort entries and they're talking about jobs, they're talking about trends, they're talking about the next program where they're going to learn skills. And so the job gets done while information is being passed around. So maybe in two hours they have done more to communicate professionally than they would have if they tried to grab a coffee.
at some point during the day. It is not easy, but it's essential. And so if you start to think of it as being really essential, where even if it's once a month, you say, this is the day that I'm going to meet with three people and we're going to have a beer or we're going to go and have dinner or we're going to have lunch or something and catch up professionally. The News Women's Club started a thing that we call No Agenda Tuesdays. They're once a month, the third Tuesday of the month, and we meet at some watering hole in town. It, we, we move it around town, the White Horse Tavern or some old great journalist's writer's tavern. And once a month, we meet to do nothing but exchange information, catch up, talk, talk about jobs, talk about programs, talk about each other's lives. And we get anywhere from on a, on a day where it's not snowing or raining, we can pull in 40 people. They're all busy. But we see, that's the difference. Guys will go for that beer after work. Women go, oh, I've got so much to do. I don't know how I'm going to find the time. They make the time. And it's a smart thing to do. And so what I'm saying is we need to learn from each other, not to isolate each other in, in groups or at work. You have to find the time. Hi, I'm Sydney Beveridge, an alum and uh, doing a mixture of media work uh, these days. And actually, I happily have lots of business cards in my pocket right now and have promoted a couple things via Twitter already. And uh, really glad to hear your words. Actually, I was in a room full of women in media just a couple weeks ago, and there's still this really strong aversion to even the term networking or the term self-promotion. And I would just love a couple of like, how do you talk to someone who's, you know, very tentative about that and sort of help dispel that it's not an agenda-driven or, or needs-based, or, you know, it, what do you say to, to, to skeptics to help get them on board? This is a very good question. And we just had a situation during the week where what happens because the way the News Women's Club was established, I keep going back to this because it's a very good model. The way it was established, these women who would step on each other's heads to get the story first during the day, we'd meet at night over a beer or over a sandwich or whatever, and they would talk about what they needed. What did they need on the job, blah, 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 blah. And because it was ingrained in the organization, it's still the way it functions. So we email each other. Every once in a while you see an email from somebody, uh, do you know anybody at New York Magazine because there's a job I'm going to apply for? Can you give me any suggestions about how to approach this? Could you review my resume, blah, blah, blah. Somebody emailed during the week and said, uh, I've got the dream job, and now I just have to secure it. Oh, okay, what you mean is you found an ad somewhere for the dream job, and you want to go for it. And this is not a classic networker. Just so happens that it's at a, a global scale news organization where a man I know who's in the business recently turned for a new kind of job, just the next phase of his career. And he got the name of the senior talent guy and called him and made an appointment to have coffee with him next week. So I said, well, it just so happens that I know who the guy is. I know I have the name. We can probably get the phone number. And you should call him directly and see if you can set up an appointment. And an email came back and said, that's awfully forward. OK, so let me tell you what this guy did. And I tell her in the email, do you want an appointment with this man or not? That's what you need to do. You need to step forward and do this. So she took my email and flipped it to somebody else in her network and said, what is your opinion of this? And this person went back to her and said, you really need to do this. So while she, this is a person who doesn't think she networks, she actually does. But when you say networking, she wants to barf because she doesn't think she has enough time to network. But we all do it to a certain extent. 
What we need to do is seriously pursue it, consciously pursue it. And for the naysayers, you just have to wait until they really need somebody. And then you say, okay, so there's three people who can help you with this. And you pass along the names. You just started their network. It's not easy for people. It's not easy for people with lots of responsibilities outside the office. But you win them over when they need it most. You can't really sell them on it. You can talk about it and always give examples about when it works and how it works. But there's always going to be naysayers right? uh, about everything. But show them. It's, it's show, tell, do. Tell, show, do. Tell them, show them, and then let them go and do it. Um, I, had, I had a quick question. How do you get around an insecure female manager? How do you get around that? Do you have any advice? <laughs> Find another job. Um, that's it's very difficult because I think that any manager can feel threatened by a particular type of staff person. You know, if somebody is extraordinarily ambitious and they overtly show that they're, up, they're out to unseat somebody, that could make you nervous and insecure. Some people just are insecure, and so if you get a real strong personality, someone who, who's ambitious, a very hard worker, someone who's willing to stay long hours, work on the weekends, answer email at midnight, that's even more, that's threatening for someone who is sort of weak and just very comfortable in their position and doesn't expect to go very far. It can be very challenging to manage, because you do have to manage your managers. It's very challenging to manage an insecure manager. There's very little you can do. If you are ambitious, if, it's, if you're in an environment where you think you could advance, and the manager is in your way because they're threatened, because they're insecure. You need to see how you can move laterally. Sometimes, sometimes you can't make the big move out. You need to look at lateral movements that'll take you away from the insecure manager or the incompetent manager. Some, some people just are in the wrong jobs. And sometimes you have to make a lateral move or you have to go somewhere else. I mean, that, that's a, it's a very difficult situation. Insecure people, if you think about people who are insecure, whether they're at work, in the workplace, or on the outside, it's, it's very tough to be reassuring that you're not a threat, especially in a workplace where if you're extremely competent and ambitious, you are a threat. Um, hi. Up here. <laughs> Hi. I was wondering what advice you have in terms of, you know, there's networking where you're reaching out to people and meeting them, but what about connecting other people? So for example, let's say um, I know Izzy here and I know someone that I'm just starting to network with and I think that they should really meet. What advice would you have in terms of connecting them without necessarily overstepping my bounds, boundaries, for example? That's a good question. We do this a lot. but. I will always call my contact, the person in my network first. Like, Rita and I work very closely together, helping people get freelance assignments and moving careers along. And so I will always call Reader because I know she gets tons of emails. I get hundreds of emails a day, business emails. So I call Reader and say, hey, is it okay if I introduce you by email to so-and-so? I've never known her to say no. Some people will say, well, I don't think I'm the right person for this, but I can tell you who to call. Or I can, make, can I make a suggestion? Why don't you see if you can get in touch with? And so the network starts to move, sort of like, you know, the little, uh, the little lights on the grid start to move around. And then once you've made the connection, I always ask permission. I don't want to tick anybody off. We're all very busy. Some people don't like to get daubed into something without advance notice. And they might have a better suggestion. So I ask first, and then I make the contact. That's what we ultimately ended up doing with the person who I had to tell the, the story about how my male friend got the interview. And um, 
we just, you know, sort of maneuvered it around, and then when she, we act she actually decided she was going to email this man, she decided not to call him. She was gonna email him. I said, well, yeah, use my name, because we have, we have a common connection. So, but I, I, my recommendation is ask, and then put them in touch by email first and let them sort it out. Then you back off. Um, if it works, fine. If it doesn't, you'll find out about it. Did that answer your question? Hi, <clears throat> um, my name's Yvonne Liao. I'm the director of video at Digital First Media. Very big proponent of networking, and I definitely understand where you're coming from. Part of the art of networking also is like what you kind of touched on is the paying it forward and making those connections between other folks in your network. What is your process for receiving and kind of dealing with folks that you don't know very well, but who have reached out to you um, in the art of networking and deciding whether or not to make a referral or put your name out there for them? Um, at what point do you put your neck out there, and how do you make that decision? That's a good, those are good questions. I personally don't mind when people cold call me or when they cold email me, provided it's for something that they've actually thought through. So if they, they want to reach me because I'm an editor for Reuters, uh, my hope is that they will have thought through what Reuters is and that they're, they're they're reaching out to me in the context of that if they're looking for some kind of assistance for how do I, how do I find out about jobs at Reuters or uh, I applied for such and such a job, is there a manager who's a hiring manager or whatever. Um, I don't give out confidential company information. I don't give out personal information about anybody. I figure if you want somebody to know something about you, you'll tell them. Um, but I will make contact. So for example, if you were to, to email me and say, um, I'm, I'm actually going to a posting in Beijing, and I was wondering if you could put me in touch. I, I, I read about the News Women's Club, and I know that you guys you know, have this organization, yada, yada. I was wondering if you could put me in touch with people at Reuters Beijing Bureau. Sure. Um, if you write to me and say, um, hi, could you tell me how to write a resume? I will get you a website, and that will be my reply. Teach thyself. Go fishing. Um, there's too much out there. So it depends on the nature of the inquiry. Um, some people hate it. I know people who are so bogged down with email that anything that gets in, the, in between the business emails is an annoyance and they just spike it. They just delete it. So a lot has to do with the person, the organization, the, the reason you're getting in touch with them. Um, I w advise never email someone cold and ask them for personal information about somebody else. If you want to reach out to someone, do, do you have an email address? Do you have a phone number? Why? Uh, so I can tell them you're trying to reach them. Well, I'll be happy to pass the information on. Um, as journalists, we get a little um, protective of each other. When it comes to general information, are you teaching courses at Columbia this year? Um, what would you recommend I study if I want to do this? Could you recommend a contact at DNA Info because I'd like to try to sell them freelance? photography. Well, all those things we, I do all the time. And I know Rita does, and I know a number of women in this room who also do it. Maria Aspen uh, is, Maria, where are you? There she is. We've networked in the past. Um, we've put Maria and, and other people together. So keep it in context. I don't see anything wrong with cold calling or cold emailing someone, provided it's in context and they're not going to say, well, why, why me? Why are you calling me? Because then they just get annoyed. Did that answer your questions? Um, I have to look for who has the microphone. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, um, I'm a visiting student here. And one Where thing are you I, from? I'm from China. Ah. 
Uh, and the thing ab I know about networking is that you have to make you have to make sure that you make the mutual contribution and commitment in order to maintain your networking. And my problem is that as a as a student, whenever I try to reach out to a person who I consider as more knowledgeable and more skillful than me, I always felt that um, I always question my um, personal ability of um, giving enough or contributing enough to this group. So this kind of mentality always like hold me back, so what's your suggestion for students like me who try to... Take again? the chain off your neck. <laughs> because you're holding yourself back is correct, all right? People like Rita and... Uh, people like to give. Yeah, exactly. They, they want to help. And in the environment we're fostering here at the Newswomen's Club of New York, at Women's E! News, all over our industry, we want to bring you along. Just think before you open your mouth or before you type your email so that it's a smart, quick thing. We understand what's happening. We, we have a sense of what you want or we have a sense of what you, we think you want, but maybe it's not too clear. Someone's going to get, someone will reach out. I remember many years ago, I started stringing right out of high school for the Daily News, WHN, and WNBC radios. And I covered for WHN Live. Two ships collided in the Narrows. And I, at the time, lived about 20 blocks away and got there like the cops were still coming. And I had always what I called reporter's change in my pockets for phone calls. And the kids, kids are great. Right? Something bad happens, kids are all over the place, and they usually know exactly what's happened, too. So I took out like all this change, and I gave it to kids and said, go use every payphone, go call your mothers right now. Keep every payphone occupied, and if you do that for 20 minutes, I will give each one of you a dollar. Now, that is a lot of money, because I had about $2 a day to eat and on my salary. And they did it. And so I called WHN as standing right at the edge of the harbor, looking out at this hellacious fire that would just burn the backside of the Verrazano Bridge. And they interrupted their broadcasting. We did it live. And they were way out in front of everybody. The kids came back for their money. It was fine. About two weeks later, a guy from the station called and said, we have a rare job opening. We never get reporter job openings here. You've got to call the news director. Here's his number. It was a Sunday. I was like, oh God, I can't do this. I can't call this man at home. This is really like foolish and stupid. I'll call him Monday. The job is filled. He filled that job over the weekend. I thought I was overstepping. I was, I was just about 20. And I thought, oh man, I have no right to call him and interrupt his weekend. But did I learn a lesson? Let us decide if what you have to say is valuable. Say it. Just say it. You know, we were talking before we started here about, um, People, you know, talking about how hard it is to get into international reporting, how hard it is to get into photojournalism. So what? Rise to the challenge. Take, take the shackles off yourself and just go and do what you feel is the intelligent right thing to do. And if you step in it, someone, there will be somebody to help you get out of it, get out of the jam, if you have that network in place. That network is invaluable. So the answer is just go for it, just do it. Thanks. We have one last question. Hi, my name is Valerie Williams Sanchez. I'm a graduate of the J School from 1994, kind of ways back. My question is really succinct, uh, understanding we're short on time. When you're in the process of networking for whatever goal, objective you have, how do you make sure that you thank the people who might be speaking on your behalf, giving you information, or helping you in, in some way? I'm sorry, tell me that again. How do you thank? How do you, sh you know, 
do you just send a thank you card to someone who might write a letter oh, on your behalf? Them. How do you thank them? Yeah, how do you make sure that they know you appreciate and you're not taking advantage of them or, you know, you're just, you know? That's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm a manager who doesn't like thank you letters. I just think that is so like over the top. So, you know, if I send you a birthday present, send me a thank you note, that's fine. But don't thank me for talking to you for a job. I'm supposed to do that. You know, if you have other questions or if you want to repitch after the job interview, repitch. It was really great, you know, sitting, having the opportunity to discuss this job with you. And now that I've had 24 hours since we met, I think you would also like to know that blah, 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 and, and I think that's really useful for this position. Fine. You know, or here's, here are the references you asked for, and I found all these links online to clips that you, might be useful since you asked about some of the things I did in Ethiopia or wherever, right? Um, pick up the phone. What I've discovered through the News Women's Club is that when we, we do a lot of things electronically, so does Amy at the Overseas Press Club, um, but I'm finding that people are so technologied out that they love a phone call. The occasional phone call goes a long way. The occasional... Um, Note, I, 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 I sit at the club sometimes with some note paper and I just write to people to invite them back if they haven't renewed their dues. We, you know, you're a valuable part of this network. Why don't you come back and just send a little note like that? Um, if somebody does you a real heavy, then just call them and say, thanks for doing that. I thought you might want to know what happened, how it turned out. Make it purposeful. And I don't think anybody will object to that. I think if it's gratuitous, it just becomes so hackneyed and meaningless that it goes in the circular file, wastebasket. We good? No more questions? We're out of time? We're out of time. Sorry, guys. But I'm going to stick around. I want to hear, go to Rita's panel. And, um, and I'm happy to talk to you. And also, you can reach us at the News Women's Club. OK? Good? Thank you. Oh, one last thing. One last thing. Um, some of our colleagues got into terrible trouble this week in um, Afghanistan. Anya Nedringhaus, an Associated Press photojournalist, was murdered, and her colleague um, was shot and in Afghanistan. And so what I urge you as journalists is never let a journalist fall without doing two things, grieving and raising your voices in protest for any violent act against a journalist anywhere in the world. 